If you were to read that a public hearing took place and that in the hearing someone objected to the proposed revisions to existing water quality standards because the revision violated the requirements of the state's anti-degradation policy, would you understand just what was being said? What is an anti-degradation policy? Where did it come from? What role does it play in protecting water quality? And how does it work? In the next few minutes, we'll answer those questions, not in great detail, but in enough detail to provide you with the basic idea of what the anti-degradation policy is all about. In the late 1960s, when the first national effort to set water quality standards began, the quality of many of our rivers, lakes, streams, and harbors was poor. However, much of our water was of very high quality. As the country began an extensive and expensive national cleanup of polluted waters, an interesting problem arose. How do we protect the waters that already had a quality that exceeded standards? To answer that question, it's important to recognize that water quality standards define the goals to be achieved in a water body in terms of use of the water and in terms of the quality or criteria necessary to protect that use. When you're dealing with water of poor quality, the solution is straightforward. You set the standards and clean up the water. But when the water is already better than the standard, is it possible to allow the water quality to be degraded down to the standard? Such a notion appeared to be illogical and contrary to the efforts going on to clean up the nation's water. Thus, the concept of anti-degradation was born. It was born in controversy and remains controversial, but its basic tenet of protecting existing use in water quality has remained unchanged through the years. The policy was not explicitly mentioned in the Clean Water Act until 1987, but the policy is rooted in the goal of the act to restore and maintain water quality. The anti-degradation policy was established on February 8, 1968 by the Department of the Interior, the predecessor agency to the EPA. Through the years, the policy has undergone modification and the regulatory requirements for the policy are in the Water Quality Standards Regulation. An anti-degradation policy is one of the minimum elements required to be included in a state's water quality standards. One of the interesting things to remember about anti-degradation is that it does not prohibit degradation of water quality, except in a very limited circumstance. Here's how it works. First of all, the anti-degradation policy is not just one policy, but three separate policies rolled into one. Part one of the policy says that any existing use and the water quality necessary to protect that use must be maintained and protected. You can call this the floor of water quality in the U.S. In simpler terms, it means that whatever the existing use of the water body is, you are not allowed to make it worse. If water quality needs to be improved to meet the standards, then control programs must be put into place to accomplish that. Consider that the concern of the policy is the uses of water, including swimming, boating, drinking, irrigation, various kinds of aquatic life uses, and many other uses. So when a state sets a standard, it defines a use and adopts water quality criteria to protect that use. Within a range, different levels of water quality can protect a use. While in theory, any improvements in water quality would improve a use, as a practical matter, we cannot define uses that precisely, which is why the range is important. So, part two of anti-degradation says that if water quality is better than needed to protect fishable, swimmable streams, then the water quality can be allowed to deteriorate to the level that's required to maintain a fishable, swimmable use. This is what we call tier two of anti-degradation, or high quality water. For example, let's say a water body is classified by the state for fishable, swimmable purposes. The criteria set by the state happens to be 5.0 milligrams per liter for dissolved oxygen. Someone goes out and monitors the actual water quality of the stream 
and finds out that the dissolved oxygen level is actually six milligrams per liter. In terms of the policy, that's clearly better and certainly will foster the preservation and propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife, which is what fishable really means. Of course, a state may allow the dissolved oxygen level of six to deteriorate to five, which will meet the criteria and still fully protect the existing use. However, the state cannot allow the dissolved oxygen level to go lower than five because the state has to protect the existing use, which is covered in part one of the anti-degradation policy. It would not be unreasonable for people to say that it seems that we ought to keep the dissolved oxygen level at six because it represents better water quality. This brings us to the state's actual implementation of anti-degradation, which requires the state to ask the public do we want to allow the water quality of this water body to degrade? The state may make a decision to allow the degradation, or it may decide not to allow it. In all cases, the state is required to involve the public and other federal agencies as necessary. The decision to allow deterioration in water quality is based on the finding that a lower water quality is necessary to support important economic and social development in the area in which the water is located. Also, before water quality can be considered for possible degradation, the state, municipalities, and industrial dischargers must meet all the technologically-based requirements of the Act and must meet all cost-effective and reasonable best management practices for non-point source control. The point is that the anti-degradation policy only requires that the question about degradation be asked and that a public decision be made based on data for the water body in question. The policy is neutral as to what the final decision should or should not be. Remember, the policy does not prohibit degradation except in one situation, and that situation is where the quality of water is exactly equal to that necessary to support the existing use. A common question is, if a state implements anti-degradation, is it a barrier against all economic development? The answer is no, because the public may decide that the economic development justifies the degradation. Of course, at other times, the public decision will be that the economic development is not worth the environmental costs. The third part of the anti-degradation policy has to do with ONRW, Outstanding National Resource Water. This is a use classification created by EPA, which does not allow any degradation if the state classifies the water body as ONRW. There are a couple key points to understand. First, there is no statutory or regulatory requirement that a state has to designate any water bodies as ONRWs. And second, temporary water quality degradation is allowed if temporary is defined in terms of weeks and months and not years. For example, if a sewer pipe ruptures, the water is likely to be fouled during the time that it takes to make the repairs. Now, let's look at what waters are supposed to be designated ONRW. The name Outstanding Natural Resource Water implies something of pristine quality, and such waters certainly are candidates for the designation. However, any water of ecological significance can be a candidate. For example, a swamp might be considered to be very important ecologically, but the normal standards use classifications and water quality criteria don't apply particularly well. So the state could designate the swamp as an ONRW and apply a special set of standards regarding it. And that's really the point. An ONRW should be applied to waters needing special protection whether or not they actually have high quality water. Before discussing a couple of other points, let's summarize what we've covered so far. Anti-degradation began as a policy statement, not as a statutory requirement, but now it's contained in the Clean Water Act and in the Water Quality Standards Regulation. The policy does not actually prohibit degradation, except where the water quality actually matches what is needed to protect the use. In a high quality water, water quality can be degraded if a public decision is reached that determines that important economic and social development needs to be accommodated by lowering the water quality. 
and for special waters called ONRWs. The policy, in effect, permits no water quality degradation at all. Another important issue has to do with the relationship between EPA and the states. Simply put, EPA establishes the regulatory requirement to be met by the states. It is the state's policy that takes on the enforceable nature of a standard. At present, policies vary somewhat state by state, but EPA is working with the states to improve policy statements to bring them into direct compliance with EPA's regulation. So the actual implementation of anti-degradation is done by the states. It's the how aspect that's being brought into compliance. The states have been asked to develop an implementation method so that everyone knows how and when the policy will be applied and what decision-making criteria the state will use. This is where a lot of work remains to be done. To help with this work, EPA provides, free of charge, the Water Quality Standards Handbook, which contains the guidance EPA has for the policy, and questions and answers on anti-degradation. These books and other information about the Water Quality Standards Program may be obtained from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Office of Water Regulations and Standards, Criteria and Standards Division, 401 M Street Southwest, WH 585, Washington, D.C., 20460. Information about the Water Quality Standards Program also may be obtained from EPA's regional offices at the addresses that follow. Contact the Water Quality Standards Coordinator at the appropriate regional office.